Atkinson talking about those crossovers. One of the biggest ones, you go back to Pat Dye, who was an All-American here at Georgia. You're exactly right. And we look at Auburn's keys to success, win time of possession. They've been phenomenal. Run and play action is their game. And stay out of third and long. Ball control and run the football for Auburn. First down, play action, they swing it out, here's Irons. 30, 35, 40, 45, going to be covered and knocked out of bounds at the 45, but that is a gain of 15. Tony Taylor with his third tackle, but way downfield. And we talk about this big athletic line of Auburn. Watch number 76, Duckworth, right there in the open field. Gets an excellent block, and then the straight-ahead north and south speed of Kenny Irons. But run an athletic offensive line for Auburn. Irons going down hard. <laughs> little conversation with the uh, Georgia players over there on their side of the field. But they move the sticks again now from the 45-yard line. They give it to him again. Great guard, not much doing. Stepping up immediately was Demario Minter, the senior out of Stone Mountain, Georgia. You talk about this Auburn offense, number one in the Southeastern Conference in total offense, 435 yards a game. And, Ron, they put on a clinic last week against Kentucky with drives of 80, 80, 80, 80, and 75. I don't know if I've ever heard of that in major college football. You see how they're starting up here tonight. Ninth play of the drive. Conservative and safe plays for the young quarterback. Play action here. They're rolling out. Looking for Obermano, and he just overthrows it. He could, he could tell that the man coverage was adequate enough as Charles Johnson was chasing him, and he just threw it away to make sure they didn't come up with a turnover. An excellent coverage by DeMario Minter, the corner playing off man, closes on it, and again, a good decision by Brandon Cox. So it's third down. The line to make, they've got to take it across midfield. You see the yellow stripe right there on the 45 of the Georgia Bulldogs. to the first down. Take a look at Al Borges. Another excellent call, Ron, of taking the pressure off the quarterback, Brandon Cox. Really, that's a basically a running play right there. And this tackles by Georgia. But excellent job since the Georgia... Developing this young quarterback. You know, actually, I called it a screen when I saw the offensive lineman releasing a little bit, but that was not the case. You're exactly right. They just had him in traffic, ran his pattern, and picked up the first down. Got a man wide open here. That's the tight end, Cooper Wallace, at the 40, inside the 35. Greg Blue finally in the tackle, but it's a gain of 14 yards. Holly Rowe, let's check back down on the sideline with you. So, guys, offensive coordinator for Auburn, Al Borges, just told us something interesting this week. He said he has found when teams are coming off a of bye week, like Georgia is, that their players get so tuned in to one thing that he thinks that they can have some disinformation here to confuse the defense. He said they're so tuned in to, hey, if Auburn does this, that means they're going to do this. So he's purposely trying to mix it up here early to get Georgia wondering what happened to all their tendencies. Well, it's a great point because he certainly has them off stride right now. Pass out to Irons incomplete. And in fact, Irons went through the hole. <laughs> and I thought, boy, if they'd given him the football, he might still be running. It was Jarvis Jackson who was trying to cover on the play. But that'll slow down the momentum just a little bit. And it really is remarkable when you think of the first round draft choices missing from this Auburn offense. Two running backs in the top five picks, but they are more productive than they were a year ago. Any first round quarterback drafted last year. 12 plays, and you see the yardage right there so far. Georgia crowding at the line of scrimmage with the backers and the corner on top. Let's see if they come. Nope, they stay at home. They look for the running play. Irons has five, has ten. He's off. 
Tigers from 30 yards away. offensive line in the country and look at the effort right here by the undersized center Joe Cope staying on this double team block and the north and south explosion by Kenny Irons and by the he actually got a second block he released off the double team inside and went down and picked up someone in the secondary great hustle by Cope John Vaughn with the extra point attempt it's up and it is good let's take a timeout Whoa, Auburn takes the opening kickoff and marches strongly down the field. They have taken the lead, 7 to nothing. Auburn on top, 7 to nothing. Great effort by the center, Cope, Bob. You talk about little things win football games, and Joe Cope with great effort. First, you're going to see him on Kedrick Golston, the nose guard. Now, Ronnie goes to the second level, and right here, he gets the block on Greg Blue to spring Kenny Irons. 90-yard drive by that offense, and Ron, I said it in the open, this may be the best offensive line in college football this year. You know, they're saying officially 92 yards on it, so that is the longest of the year. Bob, baby, 13 plays, 5 minutes and 15 seconds. Clark with a kickoff. And he's going to boot this one out of bounds. So Georgia will take it over at the 35-yard line. And you'll hear the roar from the crowd because number three is healthy again. Injured the knee against Arkansas and then missed Florida. And Ron, the most frequently asked question the last three weeks in the state of Georgia, how's the knee? You don't even have to say the name. Just how's the knee? We're about to find out right now. Left knee injury in the Arkansas game. D.J. Shockley back after the open date last week. You know, make no mistake about it. He has not been quiet about the fact he does not like wearing a knee brace, but they were getting him one that was a little less heavy. And you see it on his left knee there. We'll see if he is encumbered when he, you know, tucks the ball and runs. Got to keep it on the ground with Thomas Brown. Breaks it open. Five, ten. Cut it off at 17 yards. Will Herring finally makes the tackle. Specialist. Leonard Pope, he's the go-to guy anytime they've got to have a situation. 6'7, 250. Not many folks stop him. The offensive line, Max Gene Gillis. Outstanding right guard at 6'4, 340 pounds. First throw. Chuckley got it complete. And the man I was just talking about, Leonard Pope, the huge tight end, will go for 15 yards. And just like that, they are into Auburn territory and another first down. Georgia wasting no time. Going to hand it off again. Thomas Brown spinning around for a three yards. Travis Williams, the middle linebacker, is there to make the tackle for the Auburn Tigers. Georgia opening up with a no-huddle offense right now. Taking advantage, Ron, of that open date they had last week. This is something new for the Georgia Bulldogs right now. So we talked about what Al Burgess said, and, you know, what's good for one is good for the other. They both had a little thing in their side pocket there, right? Second down and seven. Shot steps up, drills it. Incomplete. Probably should have been caught by Sean Bailey. So let's go back to the lineups here. For Auburn on defense, T.J. Jackson. The opposing coaches just kind of grimace when you bring up his name. He is a tough competitor in the middle. Outstanding group of linebackers. Travis Williams, a really good one there in the, in the middle. And in the secondary, Will Height. Well, he really has improved. Gandy, Herring, and David Irons out of Central Georgia making up the remainder of the secondary. Third down, they need the 25. Throws to the end zone. Kenneth Harris has it in and out of his hands. And in into one of the watering hoses that they use on the field. And 
a problem all season for Georgia. Has been inconsistent play by their wide receivers. Here you're going to see Kenneth Harris. Whoa. Excellent throw by DJ Shockley. On third down run, Sean Bailey dropped a short completion. The Georgia receivers inconsistent all year. 49 yard attempt coming up by Brandon Katu. Ball is down. He's got plenty of distance, and he's good. His longest in his career is 58 yards against Louisiana Monroe. That one, 49. Let's take a timeout. 7 3, our new score. We'll be right back. Get to throw it. Intercepted at the 50 yard line. The young man who was substituting for Tim Jennings tonight, who was an injured ankle, comes up with an interception. How big is that? And Auburn, Auburn is going to bring the big wide receiver mix in motion and come back out on a little option route. And Paul Oliver, who gets the start tonight for Tim Jennings, the ball terribly thrown by Brandon Cox. Ron, probably miscommunication between the receiver and the quarterback right there. Big turnover early in this game. Well, Oliver was looking for confidence to open this evening. That certainly should have been a shot of confidence right there. A scrimmage from the Auburn 47. has become the go-to receiver for this young Georgia wide receiver core. But excellent play call, Ron. When we saw them early in the year, the coaches raved about him and said he is a, a player with a huge amount of top side. He showed just now why he is becoming the go-to guy. Pass over the middle, caught at the end zone line, and gathered in at the one is Leonard Pope. And that's the unstoppable one we talked about in the starting lineups at 6'7", 250 pounds. And Ron, I think DJ Shockley's knee is okay. Watch the big 6'8", tight end right here. He's all of 6'8", to catch that. And then the hand-eye focus and control to be able to take that football in. That is a 6'8", 250-pound tight end on that catch. First down and goal. At about a yard and a half away. Leaping at the line of scrimmage. There's nothing there for Danny Weir. Well, the linebackers were right there. They were leaping at the same time. Led by Antarius Williams, the junior out of Columbus, Georgia. You have to think. With Max Gene Gillis at 6'4", 340, and Dennis Rowland at right tackle at 6'9", 309, that the right side, or wherever they are, this time they flipped them, but that's where they would go. And Leonard Polk goes to that strong side. That's a lot of beef on that left side or strong side of that offensive line. Auburn wants a timeout. 41 seconds left in this opening quarter and we'll hold it right here. Ron, we mentioned the strong side of Georgia's offensive line. They don't play a right guard, right tackle. They play a strong side guard, strong side tackle. They always stay together and we look at that size. Gene Gillis, 6'4", 340. Roland, 6'9", 309. And Pope, 6'7", 250. And probably the guy that's been developed the most is Roland, the big offensive tackle. This guy right here, Gene Gillis, probably the number one guard that will be picked in the NFL he draft. Be, huh? He is that good. You know, and the interesting thing, you remember we talked with him the last time we were in town, and it, you talk about a kid that is really driven and has so much want to. And he just said, you know, that, that's my desire. I want to be the first guard taken in the NFL draft. And how about these numbers? Bench is 530 pounds, a 62 jacket, 
He is a strong, strong guy. I think they're going to go to the left right here. Oh, a lot of folks over there. That's Milner in motion. Going to take it back to the right and hit behind the line of scrimmage. That is a great job of penetration by Gunn. Number 48, the junior out of Alexander City, Alabama. Got the penetration. And boy, then he got a lot of help from friends. Maybe they should have gone to the left. <laughs> Tried to fool somebody. It didn't work. One of the things you find out quickly in this conference, you're going to run anything that goes east and west. You better be quick. And now we may find out how DJ Shockley's leg is, that left knee run, because this is an obvious quarterback run situation. Danny Ware is the teal back. Mentor again in motion. A Milner, I should say. It's Pope who splits out to the left. Well, not going to throw the fade. He's just going to throw it away. Is there and he makes the pass for the touchdown. And everybody around Georgia football wanted to know where's Leonard Pope? Only one touchdown catch this year. Last year, Ron, he had five straight games in which he had a touchdown catch. Leonard Pope is back. For the world, it looks as though he was just going to throw that one away. The big Leonard went in, up, and gathered the touchdown. 10 to 7. Georgia goes on top. The two of the extra point as you take one more look at Pope. All six seven. Fast paced first half by both offenses. Defenses are settling things down just a little bit until this play because here goes Irons. Breaking it back to 50. Check it as Brad Lester. His counterpart, who shows that he can break it away, and that's good for 30 yards. Brad Lester out of Lilburn. And is that offensive line good? He is going to go untouched right there. Excellent block right here by Ben Grubbs. And wow, Ron, that is a crater right there that he runs through. <laughs> could turn into very quickly. Get behind the line of scrimmage, breaks away. Going to have three yards in the play. And these two young men at this rate right now, they're going to have people in Auburn, Georgia saying, Ronnie who and Cadillac who in a short period of time. And the coaches say Brad Lester is the most explosive back. Started against Arkansas, pulled his groin. Don't get hurt, Brad Lester. <laughs> Look at the average. Kenny Irons will be in the game. Almost seven yards a carry. Sets in the pocket. Going to go long. And it is caught by Mix. Anthony Mix. receiver in a tight end's body right here is going to come out of the bunch formation and run a wheel route on Paul Oliver. This guy is 6'5", 240. Really good coverage, but just a perfectly thrown football by Brandon Cox. Ron, that is good as you can throw that football. So the ball was fumbled. I saw the beanbag go down and they have spotted it the six-yard line rather than at the yard and a half line. Kenny Irons comes into the ball game for the Auburn Tigers. Pitch back goes to Irons. Turns the corner. Touchdown, Auburn. Slaughter the fullback with a paving block. And Leon Hart, number 72, the backup offensive guard run in the football game. An impressive display of power and also throwing on that great fire to that by the quarterback, Brandon Scott. John Vaughn with the extra point attempt. Kick is up and it is good. 
So let's take a timeout. 618 left until halftime, and Auburn has retaken the lead by four. Second down at 11. Little play action. Shockley under heavy pressure. Steps up into the pocket. Gets away. And he's all the way down to the 10 yard line. TJ Jackson finally made the stop. After Shockley ran by about six defenders. Are we officially done talking about the knee and the knee brace now? As you look at that athleticism right there. Tell you what, David Green must have been a heck of a player to start 52 straight games ahead of DJ Shockley here in Georgia. Well, for starters, he was. But plus the fact DJ was unfortunate and had a couple of injuries at sideline did as well. Sets in the pocket, throws this one incomplete. Massacre could not hold on at the one yard line. Montavious Pitts was covering, but if he can hold on, that's a touch. And Muhammad Massacre. Right here on the little inside route. Wow. Hard to see right there. Looks like maybe Montavis Pitts run did get a hand on that football. Great pressure right there by Travis Williams, the linebacker. Show the field goal attempt about to come to two. Let's take a look at our All-State kick chart. From this distance right here, he's perfect. Eight of eight in his career. Ball is down and obviously plenty of distance, and he is perfect now nine of nine. And we have a one-point ball game at the 113 mark. Holly Rowe, let's check with you. Well, guys, we're talking about DJ Shockley and his knee, but people don't realize just what this young man went through to get back for this game. He has only got one class, which is three credit hours, so he had all day, almost every day, to rehab this knee. I said, what did you do specifically? He said, it's more like, what didn't I do? He did ultrasound. He used laser therapy. He got in the pool so he could move laterally. He tried heat. He tried cold. And then repeated. So DJ Shackley doing everything in his power. I said, why was it so important to you? He said, this team is important to me, and they needed me. He also rode a horse, too. We're going to show that in yeah, a second and half. Mark Rick took them yeah. out. The final bit of that uh, recovery process, rehab process, was to put them on a horse. But you know what, what happened? They had been good. At this time of year, things get boring. You, you, so they find something different to do. They've been going to the aquatic center, but they go to the equestrian center. And everybody was shocked. And here's DJ showing you how much he has. He walked behind the horse. DJ, don't do that, partner. But here he is riding, injured knee and all. Now, probably the, the scariest thing is this fellow right here. That's the biggest man ever to be at that equestrian center. Jerry go out on that Anderson, and say that right now. He weighs 315 pounds. We're still trying to get word on who was more shaken, the horse or Gerald. But I'll tell you who else rode was the big right tackle. Dennis Rowland, who's 6'9". Well, the horse is in rehab now, following that same rehab process DJ Shockley did. Here comes the kick. Trey Smith going to take this one in the end zone, and they will go from the 20-yard line. Monday Night Countdown brings you all of the latest news and notes from around the NFL, leading up to kickoff of Monday Night Football. Monday Night's Countdown delivered by UPS, 7.30 Eastern. Then be sure and join Al Michaels and John Madden in Philly for a vital NFC East matchup with the struggling Eagles need a win against the visiting Cowboys. Monday Night Football, 9 Eastern on ABC. We don't have to talk about Carol Owens, do we? Not me. <laughs> Please, that's not how much conversation. Say it, but it's not that play. It's not play. Here's a draw play. Going to go for short yardage as Blue is there to make the tackle on Kenny Irons. And Georgia with two timeouts left in the half. Probably see what happened here on second down, Ron, and may use that timeout right here after this play. Auburn really taking their time here. And you're exactly right. Mark Rick continues to look up at the clock. Brandon Cox. His ball club on top by one. 14 to 13. With a half minute left until halftime. Pitchback goes to Iron. Turns the corner, has five, still running, has 10, and counted off at about 11 
yards in the play, and they will move the sticks. It's first down, Tigers. Trey Battle finally stopped him. I think Georgia will forget about that timeout right now, but you see why this Auburn offense, since the second half of the Arkansas game, has just come on and been dominant on running the football. Clock is down to 11, now 10. Both clubs headed for the locker room. not returnable. Holly Rowe, let's check with you. Well, guys, catching up with both coaches at halftime, Mark Rick said he's very concerned about their run fits. He said, we really have no excuses. We just had some bad guys, two guys in one gap on that running game in the first half, and Auburn really gashed us. He said they've got to get that straightened out for a second. Now for Auburn, Tommy Tupperville has said they've got to do a better job on their offensive line getting a push. He said, we're getting pushed around up there, not creating enough of a pocket for Brandon Cox. So look for them to control that a little better here in the second half. Okay, Holly. Boy, some impressive numbers on Tuberville when leading the last two seasons at halftime. And that running total goes up. You start getting about 200 yards on the ground, but you're very hard to beat. I don't care who you are. Here comes the blitz. Shaka gets away from one, gets away from two, and he's off. Finally stopped. That's a gain of 25 yards by Shaka. David Irons finally made the tackle. See Auburn right now in double eagle old bear defense. And right here, they're playing man to man coverage. And anytime you're playing man to man coverage, Ron, and the quarterback can break the line of scrimmage, you look right here, there is nobody on that side of the football field. So Shockley with an extremely impressive start to open the second half. You see his numbers passing, one touchdown, no interceptions, and the rushing in the first half, three for 34. Wants to throw, gonna go deep, left side, pretty good coverage right there. The locals want to pass interference, but that's not gonna be called. It was Will Hyde, he was down there step for step with Muhammad Masakwai. Excellent coverage by Jonathan Will Hyde, who has started the last several football games for Auburn. Davis Pitts. They go up the top to Muhammad Massaqua. That is great coverage. Muhammad Massaqua from Charlotte, North Carolina, same high school as the Leak Brothers. Coming out of a good passing offense in high school. Brian McClendon, number 16, checks into the lineup. They'll go over the running play to Thomas Brown. Oh, he's high stepping and going to fight his way for the first down. As you can see, him twisting and turning, and he takes it down to the 42 yard line. Excellent play by the fullback right here. Right here, watch him as the lead blocker. He's going to come around and chop. Brandon Sutherland, the fullback right here, Ron. Right there, gets the linebacker, Karibi Didi, on the ground. Tony Milton will come in the ballgame at fullback, number nine. on the cover. I don't think he could be covered much better. David Irons up there in bump and run coverage. But excellent throw by DJ Shockley. See the multiple substitutions coming in. Chester Adams and Michael Turner on the offensive line. The extra tight end checks in. Run this Georgia offense so much more dependent on the play of the quarterback than the Auburn offense. A lot of it on D.J. Shockley. Second down and short. Down to play with, but they're going to not go there. In fact, the running play, though, with Sutherland, they're not going to pick up the first down. It's going to be third down and maybe just a little bit longer. Gunn and Wayne Dickens combining on the stop. 
And we look at Mark Rick. Now back to my point of being dependent on the quarterback play. That's why it was such a devastating loss for DJ Shopping not to play the second half against Arkansas in the big game against Florida. Because so much of this offense on the quarterback. Third down is short, but this is two down territory right here. Or four down territory, I think. Play clock still plenty of time as they come to the line of scrimmage. It's still at 10. Auburn games up at the line of scrimmage. Milner goes in motion and handed off to the fullback Sutherland, and he'll have the first down, plus about three or four more. And Terrius Williams making the stop. Georgia offensive coaches say Brandon Sutherland, the perfect fullback, runs a 4-5-5 five, five at 240 pounds. Looks like a fullback supposed to look, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. And you know, plus they, he catches the ball well. They they like his abilities in a lot of different ways. Capacity crowd here tonight, Athens, Georgia. Oldest rivalry in the Deep South. The 109th meeting between Georgia and Auburn. And it's a one-point game. Short drop by Shockley, threw it low. Was it trapped or did he catch it? The official is going to give it to him. Massaquai on the receiving end. And every play is under review in this conference. And they're taking a look at it. I know that Rogers Redding is the, the guy who is head of that crew tonight. You get Will Hyde bailing out of there a little bit. That ball looked like it skipped to me. I'd like to see it one more time. As you mentioned, Ron, it is under review. It's under review. I think it, it bounced. I think Muhammad's going to lose a reception right there. <laughs> No, they're explaining that uh, not all plays are reviewable, but like I said, uh, talking with Rodgers before the ball game and also at halftime, I want to double check on the, the bean bag and uh, the ball that was put back at the five and a half yard line for Auburn just before they scored. Uh, and he was explaining that's where the ball was coming out, which obviously if it goes forward, they bring it back. But in this case right here, they, they are reviewing every play, and it's one that they think needs to go under even, even a tighter scrutiny, meaning that the referee comes over and visits with them. And I'm with Bob. I think they're going to take this one away. Once again, it has to be indisputable evidence. They ruled it a catch, so they need that evidence to overturn. But I think you can see the ball skip. You know, you really do, Ron, have to give credit to Dave Perry in the Big Ten Conference for really going out kind of as guinea pigs and starting the replay system now that's been really embraced by everyone in college football. But I remember a year ago how controversial in some ways it was, how nervous everyone was about how that would go, but it was a huge success. Taking a lot of time right now for a about a six yard gain, but as you mentioned, every play critical in a game like this and the magnitude of this game. And you know, we'll try to show you here in the third quarter before we get too far away from it. On the last drive that Auburn scored on to go in front. After review, the pass hit the ground, therefore it is incomplete. It will be second down and 10 from the 29 yard line. Point I was going to make was. On that play back in the first half, just before Auburn uh, scored the touchdown, the ball is fumbled. Here's a key play. Watch how close. You talk about a game of inches. The catch is made. Watch the fumble. All right, it's coming out right there, but here's the important point. Look at the ball bound. If that had hit that pylon from the field of play, Auburn would not have had a touchdown. That would have been a touchback and Georgia would have had the football. That's how close these games can be. And this one looks as though it's going to be that close. A one-point ball game, 14 to 13. Shockley. Shockley. Shockley to the first and goal. 21 yards. He may be the only guy I've seen who's faster with the knee brace on than with the knee brace off. Missed tackle right there by number 31, Antarius Williams. Needs to protect that football and hold a little bit tighter, but how important 
is DJ Shockley to this offense in this Georgia football team, Ron. Gandy did a good job of breaking down, making the tackle. It's going to be the ninth play of the drive as the Bulldogs set up shop with a first and goal just inside the 10. They trail by one. Short drop. Fade route. Touchdown, Massacre. has become the guy for Georgia at receiver run. He's only dropped one pass all year. Excellent throw, though, by D.J. Shockley, putting that football where only Muhammad Masakwa could make the play and not David Irons, the quarterback. How about that drive? Boy, I'm telling you, you talk about impressive. Extra point attempt. Katu knocks it home. 10.45 left in the third quarter. New score, Bulldogs 20, Tigers 14. We will be right back. There is the touchdown that puts them back on top. Well, that is a quite a who done it. Second down and three. Irons hit behind the line of scrimmage. It's Tony Taylor. Tony's had an outstanding game tonight. And Tony Taylor won, missed two games with an elbow injury. Last year he missed all year with an ACL injury. And watch him close the gap right here. And an excellent tackle. Keep in mind, in college football, they don't have that rule like they do in the NFL. In the NFL, that would have been a penalty, grabbing him by the back of the collar right there. Nine tackles, five solo. That's a season high for him. And his coach has said this week, he's got to step up. How to have a big game. And so far, he has done just that. Short drop, nothing to the right, throws back to the left, pass incomplete. It's Anthony Mix who couldn't hold on. Paul Audible was covering. Holly Rowe will uh, check with you on the sideline. So, guys, they have taken a blow on the defensive line for Georgia. Kendrick Golston will not be able to continue. Now, the coaches call him the quarterback of their defense. He had an ankle injury to the left ankle. He taped it up, got in a three-point stand, and tried to go in the first half. But no go. He is out for the rest of the game. They'll sorely miss him up front. Although that time, forcing a three and out, they look pretty good. Okay, Holly, down on the sideline, he was talking with a teammate as, uh, as you were giving us the story. And, and I don't know if he's going to try to come back in or not. Line drive kick right here. Flowers is going to be stopped just short of the 30. Ball is loose. Bean bag is down. Auburn says they have it. And the officials, let's go. Yes, sir. Auburn Tiger football. Dee Dee recovers the football. And first of all, a line drive punt. You see the ball clearly out right there as Flowers counts it up. And Karibi Dee Dee, the linebacker, Ron. The ball looks like it's stripped out of there. Hard to see what number that was, but clearly a fumble and great field position right now for Auburn after Georgia forced the three and out. So Georgia leads at the eight and a half minute mark, 20 to 14. But a big break for the Auburn Tigers. Let's see if they can take advantage of it. Now from the Georgia 30 yard line. And no one feels worse than that young man right there, Thomas Flowers. Wow. John Vaughn to attempt the extra point, trying to make it. Auburn back on top by one. And he does. Slides it through on the left side. Let's go to break. Following the fumble, the 30-yard touchdown, Obamano on the run.
That ball got out of the house. We saw that one open the door and came out. Obviously a two-point situation right here for Georgia with the five-point lead. And one of the things, Ron, having an open date, as Georgia did last week, you have a lot of time to work on special situations like these two-point plays. So this will probably be a play that, that Auburn has not seen before. Montrez Milner, the additional tight end, comes out of the ballgame. They will go with two tailbacks. Thomas Brown, number 20, and Danny Weir, number 28. The 25 second clock is ticked down to 10. Not a bad time to call timeout. Georgia. Gonna have to hurry. Down to three. Down to two. He doesn't see it. They just got a delay of game penalty. Wow. That's a major mistake now, right there. Delay of game. Offense. Penalty will be five yards. We'll retry. And Ron, I think the two-point conversion rate from the three-yard line is about 40% success rate when you get back to the eight yard line it goes to about a 10 percent percentage rate of success so they're going to kick the extra point that was a major major mistake right there for georgia not by georgia not calling time out. Second tie and end, 87. Burns the timeout. At some point right there, you're better off to just save the timeout, get a five-yard penalty, because yeah. it's not going to make that much difference on the kick anyway. The two attempting the extra point, and he got it. So let's take a timeout. 12.33 remaining in their ballgame. Georgia, 27-21. And That's a big run, free safety coming off a hamstring injury. One of the points that the coaches made for Auburn, very good against the run, is blue, not as good in, in pass coverage, particularly one-on-one. -on -one. They got the matchup that they wanted. Irons headed for the sideline, breaks one tackle, lost the football. You see the beanbags cut in. Georgia says they have it, and the official still no signal. You can review if a fumble was caused, but you cannot review who recovers the fumble. Georgia football.
and that will be George's ball. You see Swain in there working it out. Darius, a senior out of Decatur, Georgia. Had a problem with a strained knee this year, and so now we wait for the replay. And if they're going to change it or say it stands as the call was made on the field. Ron, I don't think they can change it because it was clearly a fumble. And from that point on, it's a moot point because they signaled Georgia recovered the fumble. For a great effort again by Kenny Irons and DeMario Mentor right there knocks that ball out. You see Big Swain coming in there at about 350 pounds. Surprised on it's taken this long. Nine minutes and 47 seconds left in the ball game. Obviously, a huge play. Whether it stays with Auburn or whether it goes to Georgia. Freshman receiver on Jonathan Wilhite, Auburn's corner. of belonging, even when you're far from home. And when you hear them, you know you're with family. War Eagle. Two simple words. War Eagle. Uniquely Auburn. War Eagle. Third down. It's mix in motion. Cox is sacked. Way back at 
who was a first-round draft pick last year, kind of a kind of a defensive back, linebacker type guy. He's been injured, but you can see why you can see why Auburn tries to stay out of those long yardage situations. Interesting that they have moved the ball back up to the 15 and a half yard line, and that was clearly a fumble. Here's the boot, and they may have gotten a piece of it. It is very short and goes out of bounds around the 40-yard line. I think that Henderson is the man who got a hand on it, number 27, and caused only a 24-yard punt. Number 27, Mikey Henderson, applied the pressure on the punt. First and 10 dogs at the offer, 39. So it's first down Georgia, training by one, and they get the great field position. Danny Weir is the man operating at tailback. Shockley rolls the pocket, got it complete, and that is McClendon, number 16. Kevin Hobbs in the cover, but it's good for 14 yards. DJ Shockley on the sprint, and how about Brian? A great tailback here at Georgia. Brian McClendon has emerged in this football game, and that's been a sore spot this year for Georgia, the play of their wide receivers, Ryan. of that one. He just had to rush because of the pressure and he kicked it off the side of his foot. Pass interference for 81 on the offense. Penalties 15 yards from the previous spot. Now remains one. What the fuck? An offensive pass interference on Big Leonard right there. Get another opportunity to see it right here. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> Matched up on Will Aaron, the safety. I mean, that's a reach right there, Colin. That, that's a bad call, Ron, in that situation. So they go with the draw play to Ware. And Ware will cut it back up the old inside the 35. But he's down to around the 33 yard line. Ron, that was a huge call, that offensive pass interference, because obviously it affects field goal position. We'll take a look at it again. You see Will Herring up there. Keep in mind, it's going to be offensive pass well, interference. Well, anything is defensive holding as well. I mean, that's a no call. That's a no call. That is a no call. I mean, Herring was doing what he should do, and that's grab a piece of the jersey if you can unbeknownst to the officials. Pope and Milner and a two tight end alignment. Thomas Brown now is the man at the top of the aisle. And they'll give it to him off the right side. Turns it up, finds a bit of daylight, and he takes it back to the original line of scrimmage. And it's going to be third down and ten. Irons on the stop. You said it. It just took the offensive pass interference penalty away and they're right back where they started, which really impacts thinking one play ahead, field goal position. You have to think, Ron, Mohamed Massaqua right now, number one, or it looks like they're going to line up and run this football and play for field position. 
Third down and ten. Two tight ends. That's exactly what they do right up the middle. Not much there for Thomas Brown. Williams on the defensive play. And you hear a few scattered boos from the crowd here. But the coaching staff and Mark Rick deciding that they'll play the percentages. Brandon Cattu with a very strong leg. I think George is showing a lot of respect there for David Gibbs and Auburn's defense because Ron, Auburn has given him a lot of different looks. And this is huge. 41 yard attempt from almost right in the middle of the field. High pass from center. Got it away and he split it. Lee Jackson, give him credit. Lee Jackson handled a very bad pass from center, got it down, and the kick is good. Watch this. Tremendous job. And how about Brandon Kutu? During the off week, Georgia coach Mark Rick informed him he would be put on scholarship starting in January. That's coming off his two misses against Florida. You talk about great coaching. Bring that guy in right after he misses two field goals in the Florida game. Put him on scholarship, and Kutu is paying dividends right now on that investment. So three minutes and 25 seconds left in our ball game, and in what has been a seesaw affair, seven lead changes now. Georgia 30 and Auburn 28. Sports Center coming up next. Immediately following this ball game, John Anderson and Scott Van Pelt. LSU against Alabama. Spurrier beats Florida and upsets this Saturday. Shabbat, the thing that you have to guard against is what Al Borges and the Auburn Tigers have been able to do all night, and that is to take the football and advance it as well as any game, just rushing the football. Auburn's place kicker, number 37, one for five against LSU, but this guy would love to have an opportunity to win this football game tonight, and it may very well run, come down to John Vaughn. some distance to those kickoffs as well. He's about ready to kick the thing out of the stadium. Yeah, he, uh, he has been extremely, extremely good tonight. And if you're Georgia right now, aren't you glad that South Carolina beat Florida? You're ahead, but you still have some margin for error, Ron, because this is a two-point game. It's going to come down the line. receiving end of that one and it's about eight and a half yards on the completion and that's a cool customer right there i'm talking about brandon cox it really is remarkable ron how far he's come and he has been in this situation before think back to baton rouge when they went into overtime with lsu this is one cool guy for a young quarterback Goldston back in the ball game. Kendrick wanted to play, and they finally said, okay, get in there. Here comes the run. Irons breaks one tackle. Then good heavens. He gets sent back the other direction. You talk about some leather exchanging here. And Greg Blue, who is called the big hitter on this team. And you didn't even have to see who it was. Watch Greg Blue. He is an explosive, basically a linebacker playing back there in safety. 6'2", 214 pounds. First and 10, Auburn. Clock now under three minutes to play. Cox running out of harm's way. Here comes more pressure. It just throws this one away. Charles Johnson, number 99, was the guy coming with the pressure. And everybody in this stadium uh, held their breath because Red Blue came in a Put a lick on the wide receiver over there on the sidelines. And what Johnson is gaining on him right there. Right there. I think an excellent.
excellent no power though right there. Let him play this thing out. Crowd coming to life. And the crowd meter up on the scoreboard is showing between 100 and 102. 100 meets the loudest they can get. Here's Irish. Nothing to the right. Hit at the line of scrimmage. And he's going to be driven back. And that's Gerald Anderson, the 315 pound senior. it gets. Georgia right now playing for the East Division Championship of the Southeastern Conference. About 90,000 people going crazy and it's starting up. Third down. They've got to take it out to the 45-yard line. Georgia leads it 30 to 28. Cox steps up. The left-hander zings it. And the ball is too tall and incomplete. Intended for Courtney Taylor. If you're Auburn, Ron, you have to go for it. Two minutes and five seconds left, but you only have one timeout. In this place right now, you talk about the 12 man, it's right here in this stadium right now. Southeastern Conference East Division. Seconds showing up on the game clock. Brandon Cox stepping up, throws, get the man, and there he is, a runner should do, and he's loose. 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. to question the question that he's asking him did he punch it loose before he was in the end zone and if he did that's not the same rules fumbling the ball forward though Bad on fourth down when the offensive team fumbles the ball and the ball goes forward in this case it went in the end zone we bring the ball back to the spot that's of the fumble it's first down You cannot fumble the football forward. He lost it at around the three yard line. Courtney Taylor made the reception. You can't give him a touchdown, but it is good for 62 yards. And now Auburn will have it three yards away. And a fumble is a fumble, whether the ball is fumbled or obviously the ball has to be fumbled, as in the case of Paul Oliver punching that football. Auburn still with one timeout, man. Clock runs, a minute 45 seconds. Pitch back goes to Irons. Tries to turn the corner, and he is knocked down hard by Charles Johnson. Big Charles is there to make the hit along with Tony Taylor. And Auburn is in no hurry. Vaughn is warming up on the sideline if they score the touchdown. Or if they want 
wind up running the clock all the way down and kicking the field goal. Exactly. And Georgia with two timeouts left in this football game. They will obviously use one of those timeouts after this play. Second showing on the clock. Ron, I believe yeah, that is Georgia's last time out right there. right here he steps up in this window and throws a strike down the middle to a wide open Aramisha do and now the football is going to be fumbled right here punched out cannot fumble forward on fourth down but how about a wide open Aramisha do down the middle of that football field fourth and ten the crowd going crazy Knocked it loose. Courtney Taylor got on it. You heard the officials on fourth down. Can't fumble it forward. So they got it at the three. The final timeout called by the Bulldogs. Third and goal. And one take showing on the clock. Georgia within a breath as they lead right now by two points. A clinching, a trip to the SEC championship. And right now it is Auburn on the lip of the cup. Straight ahead. He'll take it to the two and a half oh, yard line. Gerald oh, Anderson again making the tackle. And now it is fourth down. Sports Center coming up immediately following our ball game. And Auburn's going to let this same run all the way down. And it looks as though there is about seven seconds difference between game clock and play clock. So they can run it down to somewhere around 10, 9, or even 8 seconds left in the ballgame. And they go back to the story of John Vaughn, 1 for 5 against LSU, heartbreaking loss in overtime. Tommy Tuberville comes in the office Sunday morning after going to church, and John Vaughn is out on the practice field kicking 10 footballs from every spot he missed a field goal and now this young guy Ron gets a chance for the ultimate redemption right here to beat Georgia so they do call the timeout and just as we had suspicioned eight seconds left on the clock the smart thing to do and of course that is if Auburn converts the field goal here and it should be lined up in fact the ball is right at the line where an extra point is attempted Ron you go back to the Georgia touchdown when Mark Rick wanted to go for the two-point conversion they let the clock run out the five-yard penalty they had to kick the extra point but you also go back to South Carolina beating Florida today with some margin of error for this Georgia football team because if they do lose at least they get a chance next week to get Kentucky to seal the East Division. You see, he's right in the middle of the field. And the operation, the snapper, the holder, to put yourself in the helmet right now for Tinder John Vaughn. How about the pressure, even though it's basically an extra point? Here comes the extra point that it looks like, but it's the field goal and it's the win. It would appear it is the win. We still got six seconds left on the clock, but the Auburn Tigers go back on top, and a flag is down. Here. 
and Brandon Cox, the first-year starter, stepped 62 up. 62-yard play. Unbelievable, and I'll tell you what. It's gone from as good as it can get to as bad as it can get in this stadium on one play. Well, we do have six seconds left. This kick is going to come from midfield following the roughing of the kicker with the 15-yard step off. Doesn't do much good to kick it, I guess, out of the end zone. They're still going to get it at the 20-yard line. Would you just kick it on the ground, Bob? <laughs> I'll tell you what, I might kick this sucker out of the end zone. Would you really? Because I always worry about all those throwbacks and yeah. that, that Stanford play. <laughs> I go back to that Stanford, the band play out there on the West Coast. I might take my poison with defense with six seconds left and one play left. Thomas Brown and Tyson Browning are the two deep men. Georgia is looking for a squib kick. I think you do squib this football and make Georgia have some kind of miraculous kickoff or time play to pitch it. Now let's see if, they, if they've got one in there. Nope, they're going to kick it away. You know why you do, Ron? There's no way to practice against something Georgia was about to do if you're yeah. Auburn. At least this situation, you can practice on defense. Center Joe Cody, who was injured, had to go out of the ball game. Jonathan Palmer came in, did a very nice job replacing him. But a rubbish to do, as we said, even in the starting lineups uh, tonight, he has become such a big play guy in both kick returns and also as a wide receiver. A really dangerous guy. You see the deep, deep positioning of the secondary of the Auburn Tigers. They'll let him throw it underneath, but nothing more. Still looking. Drills it. Has it complete. Massacre. And this one is over. The Auburn Tigers have just won again here at Sanford Stadium in Athens, Georgia. This time by one point. 31 to 30. And that look on that young lady's face really just about says it all. The great thing goes for Georgia. If they can beat Kentucky, they will represent the East in the Southeastern Conference Championship. And South Carolina still alive, Ron, in the East race. Let's go down to the sideline. Holly Roll is with Coach Trepperville. Holly. Coach, after everything that happened at LSU, what was going through your mind on that last kick from John Vaughn? Well, you know, you, you we, we try to think positive, but, you know, when, when – what happened last a few weeks ago, you know, you felt for the kid, but he uh, he made up for it tonight. Also, it's fourth and ten. You go for it, and Brandon Cox with the strike. How did your young quarterback perform under this pressure? Well, you know, they fortunately for us, they didn't try to pressure him. They tried to play zone. When he you play zone, you know, he kind of picked it apart. You know, we got a guy open. You know, it's, it's a fun game. Both teams play good. Georgia's a good football team. We played good tonight. Why is it that the visiting team seems to have the edge in this rivalry? I don't know, but uh, maybe we can come back again next year. They won't come to our place. All right. Congratulations, Coach. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Holly. Now here's a look at our Polaroid image of the game. And it's the game winner by John Vaughn. And as we said on the air, as it happened live, it looked like an extra point, but it was a field goal attempt. And Auburn had run the clock down to eight seconds. They kicked the field goal to win it by one. Final score, Auburn 31 and Georgia 30. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Sports Center coming up next over on ESPN News. It's more